Well, in North America, it's home to many unimaginable experiences. And I've got a collage here of a few experiences in uh, North America that are pretty unimaginable. Right here is um, Aurora Borealis, all right? You can see that, the Northern Lights in Alaska. Right here are the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, and Denali. These are all unimaginable experiences in North America. And one more is actually in Rockaway Beach, Oregon, where you can ride a mechanical corn dog. Another unimaginable experience in North America, okay? Our country is home to some unimaginable things. Isn't that great? We can just experience some really, really cool stuff in North America. And today, as we continue our Acts series, we're going to pick up in chapter two and experience an unimaginable scene, an unimaginable experience that happens to the disciples and a huge crowd of people. And chapter two is all about this iconic event called Pentecost, okay? You may have heard this, but today's chapter and studies we continue is about an unimaginable event called Pentecost. And what we're gonna see through that is the fulfillment of what Jesus talked about earlier, where he says, I'm going to bring my Holy Spirit. And more than that, he's going to be, uh, we're going to see the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. And then lastly, it's going to be the fulfillment and conclusion of what we alluded to last week. And what we're going to see is that Jesus ascends, the Holy Spirit comes down, and then people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And through all of this, this unbelievable scene of epic proportions, God is doing some God-sized things to create a movement in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And he's going to interact with people in a new way and say, I'm doing something new for now and for all time. He's gonna make himself accessible to the people then and to us now. And he's gonna do that to all people who believe in Jesus, who call him Lord and Savior. And that leads me to today's big idea. And it's this, that God has an unimaginable way of enabling believers to do his unimaginable work. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter two. If you've got this awesome blue journal Bible, we're gonna be in page eight. Uh, If you've got the big orange and gray Bible in the back, it's page 938. And if you would, just be gracious with me. I'm like on the back stages of a cold. So if I lose my voice or if I sneeze or cough, um, be gracious with me, okay? I I believe the Lord's gonna be with me through this. But as you turn there, we're gonna look through verses one through four and see the first unimaginable thing that God does is God enables believers with the Holy Spirit. Let's read verse one. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Let's stop there. Pentecost was a Jewish festival. So right now they're celebrating. And Pentecost means 50th, which essentially is 50 days after Passover. Remember, they were selling, pa- celebrating Passover during Jesus' crucifixion. Um, and, and so this is 50 days after that. But what Pentecost is, is a feast and celebration of two things. One, to commemorate the giving of the law. Remember when we studied Deuteronomy and Moses uh, was reflecting back on when they got the law at Mount Sinai that God given them the Ten Commandments? Well, they're commemorating that. They're remembering that God gave them the law. And secondly, they're celebrating and thanking God for the harvest from their crops. And I want you to remember the latter point of that. So it's a big feast. And as we read Verses two and three, we're gonna actually see this unimaginable thing happen at Pentecost. Verse two, suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. Now I wanna stop there. The first thing that we see from this is um, a sound, an audible thing, an audible unimaginable thing. That's the first sensual thing that God is doing to make his presence known. It's a violent rushing wind coming from heaven. God's spirit from scripture, why uh, why we need to take note of this is commonly referred to as wind. We've seen him as uh, reference or synonymous to wind before. And so I've never um, 
experienced a tornado up close, but I come from a region of the country where tornadoes are common in the South, okay? And so I've met people that have been in the eye of the storm, okay? They've heard it and they've had to hunker down and get close and be safe. And what they've described, a tornado sounding, this kind of twirling of rushing wind, it's like a freight train. So I can imagine this sound sounding something like a freight train. But also if we read in verse three, not only is there an unimaginable sound, there's an unimaginable sight. Verse three says, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. So right here, Tongues that were like flames of fire, real, appeared and separated and then rested on each of them. And again, just like wind was often referred or synonymous to God, so too is fire. We see in scripture that it says God was an all-consuming fire. It's referred to him in that way. Also remember Moses in the burning bush. God revealed himself in the burning bush. All of this is pointing to show that this is not like some kind of like mirage or they're hallucinating. This is a real event. And God, through Luke, like Luke is capturing all this to tell uh, the audience and the readers here that this was a real event using wind and fire to show that this was a sign that God was present and real, that the disciples were encountering God and not hallucinating or tripping, okay? And as we read verse four, we're gonna see that all of this was leading, okay, the sensual sight and sound to actual um, leading to a verbal unimaginable experience where they begin to speak in tongues. Read verse four. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And the ability to speak in tongues here is this another unimaginable thing. It's here that the moments uh, that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, and now they have the power to do some things that they weren't able to do before. And the scripture says they were enabled to speak in different tongues. And now we'll address that in a moment, what that actually means. Uh, But the main point here is to see that the power that Jesus promised to give them is finally here. Like Jesus talked about this on and on, and it is finally here. It's finally upon them. It's finally in them. And this scene of them speaking in tongues is unimaginable. And then speaking different languages, because these men are from Galilee, okay? They're blue collar. They're hicks, all right? All right, I can say that because I'm from Alabama, all right? They're uneducated. They're not like the elites that have diplomas, okay? They're not like Glenn, okay? They've got the diplomas. God is using them to do some awesome things, okay? He's falling upon them, his spirit. And God used this and used these men to get the attention of these people at this time to launch an incredible movement of God. And what's significant about all of this is that this is the moment that the physical temple, okay, that was in Jerusalem at the time, is now becoming the temple of people, Listen to this. The temple that was physically located in Jerusalem was the centerpiece for God's presence. And God at this moment is moving where his presence is in that temple now to his people. Now to anybody who believes in Christ Jesus as Lord, now is the temple of God because God is residing in them. And remember, they're in Jerusalem and the disciples are not from there. They're from Galilee. But Jesus's mission is starting here for a reason. One, because many people from around the world are in Jerusalem here for Pentecost, but two, and more importantly, Jerusalem is where the the temple was and where God's presence dwelt. So he's doing something very strategic in this moment, all right? And I want to show you this graphic about the Jewish temple, all right? This is a kind of um, kind of a slice of it, and it's zooming into this place called the Holy of holies, the most holy place. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the Ark of the Covenant held the Ten Commandments, all right? But this is where God's presence was regulated. It's where God's presence was. And one time a year, the high priest of the Jewish Levitical tribe came in there once a year to bring incense and to sprinkle blood for the Day of Atonement. And he was only allowed in there one time a year. And this is where the presence of God was. So know that 
But also what's incredible about this, if you remember this, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, we believe, not more than believe, God placed every sin on him and the wrath of God was put on him. He died the death that we deserved, okay? He bore, bore our sins for us. And at the moment that that was finished, the veil was torn. That's what scripture says. Like this veil was torn, like it was ripped in two. Look, look how big that is. I don't know how big that is, but to scale, look at that person. Okay, so this was ripped in two the moment that Jesus died. And what that signifies is that the veil was torn and that where the presence of God was is now unleashed on his people, all right? It's now unleashed on his people. The veil was torn was God's way of saying the place that held my presence, the temple, was now being unleashed on the people who believe in me. That's amazing. And the Pentecost moment is God's transitioning his presence from the old temple to the new temple, which are the hearts of men and women, which are all the people who believe that Jesus is Christ and Lord. And this is designed because this is all about Jesus's work continuing through his people. Remember, we believe that the whole book of Acts is Jesus's work continues by the Holy Spirit through his followers. And this is what this is all about. I'm taking my presence that was in the temple. Now I'm putting it in you. And why this matters, listen to this, why this matters to have this acknowledgement and um, uh, cognizant of God's spirit in us is because at this very moment, if you are a believer, if you believe in God, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a real and authentic access to God. Before you ever walked into this building, God was with you. What this passage implies is that there's no longer um, this concept that God is bound to four walls or is regulated to cathedrals or in the Holy of Holies. He's in you. That's amazing, church. For when you are in the waiting room, waiting on lab results and the blood work, God's presence is with you. When the inner child is rearing its ugly head because of abandonment issues or trauma, God is with you. His presence is with you to remind you that he is Abba, Father, your dad. When you're about to walk into a meeting room to have to have a hard, courageous conversation that you don't want to have, or you're walking into a room knowing that you're going to be the recipient of a hard conversation, God's presence is with you. Believer, you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a temple of the Most High. God's presence is with you. It's amazing news. The presence of God for all who believe is now readily available to all followers of Jesus. That is amazing news, church. But what about tongues? What about tongues? What is this all about? Is this the prayer language stuff? Is this referring to speaking in tongues, the unintelligible things that the charismatic church does? Well, let's pick up in verse five and see what this is actually all about. Verse five, now there were some Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded. And amazed, saying, look, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native tongues? Jump down to verse 12. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. Simply put, the Holy Spirit enabled disciples to speak with different languages. Jerusalem is a city house with a variety of nationalities, tribes, and tongues, and people groups. It's kind of like a city right now, like New York or Vancouver, where there's nations represented, represented all over. And the disciples were enabled to tell all of these different nations, all of these different people groups, uh, because the Holy Spirit fell on them. They were able to tell about all about God, and the hearers heard in their own language. It's like this unimaginable experience of God speaking and letting other people hear. So this passage is not about speaking a private, unintelligible language. This is about God's miraculous power enabling his disciples to speak in all languages. 
And this was the moment God made it known that his salvation, listen to this, was not just for the Israelites, it was for all people. Every tribe and tongue were welcome into the kingdom of God. It was for every walk of life, young and old, okay? It's God's way of saying, I'm the father of everyone. This is why we have the value of engage everyone, because we believe no matter who you are, where you're from, you're part of the family of God. Like, there's no elites. We don't want to show partiality. Like, wherever you're from, we want you to know that you belong in the family of God. But as we can see in this text, God's saving nature, an unimaginable scene here, rubs some people the wrong way. They didn't like this. This is like foreign to them. This is like unexplainable. So these people must be drunk. And what we see as we continue reading in verse 15 is God does an unimaginable thing through this guy named Peter, okay? And he says, hey, we're not drunk. God's just doing some crazy stuff. As we pick up in verse 15, we're going to see the second unimaginable thing is God enables believers to do his work. Verse 15, Peter says, For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. Okay, this is his way of kind of tongue-in-cheek saying, guys, look, it's too early for us to be, be drunk, all right? We haven't had enough time to be drinking. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. He's looking back to the Old Testament, and he quotes this from Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God. And what this means is, this is the new covenant, which is God's way through Jesus of doing something new through the death of burial, resurrection of Christ and all who believe in him. That's what that means, okay? And I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And Peter emerges from the crowd. This is what we see from the text. And he says, we are drunk. We're just filled with the spirit. Now, we can be a little sympathetic to the people that were kind of cynical about this because they've never seen anything like this. Like, this is supernatural. This is unimaginable. So we can be a little sympathetic to, to say, like, hey, these people are doing some crazy things. They may be drinking. But what Peter's pointing out to the Scripture, uh, what, what he's pointing out is pointing the Scripture to anchor what they're seeing to something that God, through the prophet Joel, prophesied long before, okay? And it's also helpful, helpful for us to know that anything that we do as believers now, as the church, should be anchored in Scripture, all right? So what Peter's doing is saying, hey, what you're seeing is crazy, but actually God, through Joel, prophesied this. This is anchored in the tradition of our faith. And the same thing is true for us. That's a side note. Another side note, what we also need to see here, it's a little side sermon, okay? Is that Peter is doing this beautiful um, dance of balancing spirit and truth. There's an incredible move of the spirit. Like God is doing an amazing work that's just like advancing his kingdom. Like people are getting saved and we're seeing some miraculous stuff. But also on the other side, he's anchoring it in truth with scripture. And so he's doing both. And why I share that today is sometimes we can be a part of churches or movements or even be a person that lives in one or two of those camps. For example, maybe you've been a part of a church that's just spirit-driven. Like it's just God's doing some crazy stuff and it's always spirit-driven, but there's no truth. That's a sign of an immature church or a person. Or maybe you've seen a person that's just spirit-driven, but they lack truth. That's a sign of an immature person. But the same is true on the other side of the coin. If you see a person that's just anchored in truth, in all theology, in all Bible, but there's no life in them, no spirit working power in them, that's a sign of an immature church or an immature uh, believer. And the same thing, as we test movements, as we see that, if there's no truth in the spirit-filled movement, it's something that we should be wary of, okay? And vice versa. And so what I want us to see is we look for movements and look for this in our own lives, that we need to have the spirit just as much as we have the truth. As we anchor into the truth, we need to be anchored in the spirit. So what you're seeing, back to the main sermon, is the fulfillment of God pouring out his presence on his people. And notice in the text the, the, the two dichotomies here. It says, men and women, young and old. 
What that is, is a literal context there. He's saying men and women, young and old people, will be impacted by this. But more importantly, it's the figurative sense that this is pouring out on all people. What it's saying is, is this is for all people, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. Not just the young, but the old. And Peter's words here surely got the attention of his listeners, not only on the who, but the what they would be doing, okay? He's calling out the young and the old, the men and the women, but also the what. And what is the what? To prophesy and to dream dreams. And all those two things, to prophesy and dream dreams, is a reference to the, uh, to the office of the prophet in the Old Testament. To prophesy and dream is likened to the prophets in the Old Testament. And this is the way Israel heard from God. God appointed prophets, okay? And the prophet's job was to hear from God in those days. And then they were the mouthpieces for God to the people of Israel. And these men would hear from God and deliver an encouraging word and sometimes a devastating word to the people of God, okay? And God would use these prophets to deliver instruction or heed this warning or give direction on how to obey or uh, uh, how to behave or obey the Lord. And God's people were dependent on these prophets. Like the people of Israel, if they needed to hear from God, it was from these prophets, okay? But now what God is doing is God's people no longer need the office of the Old Testament prophet to speak to them because through the final work of Jesus, who's the ultimate prophet, okay, God was unleashing his spirit onto his people and saying, now I'm giving you the ability to know and proclaim my word. Once that was regulated to the prophets, now you are able to do this. That doesn't mean that we're prophets, like capital P. It just means that we have the ability to do what the prophets did, uh, to know God personally and to proclaim his word like they did. We have access to God where they were the sole piece of access. And I know this can be confusing because we've talked about the gift of prophecy before. Similar language, but it's different in this. It's not the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy, what we see later in the New Testament, is a gift given by God, which certain people have the gift of encouraging one another through Scripture. Okay, it's not the same thing. What this is talking about is you have the ability to know God and to proclaim his word and um, to others. Who in here has used Airbnb, Turo, or um, Uber? Okay, most of you. What those are, those are all companies, part of a new market. Well, it's not new. It's been around for over um, a decade called the sharing economy. And what those companies have done have taken what hotels, rental car companies, and taxis have dominated the industry and made it where individuals like us can now have access to that market. So before, if you needed a taxi, all right, it was only regulated to taxi companies. But now with Uber, you can be a taxi driver yourself. Before, uh, if you, uh, only hotels were hotels. Now with Airbnb, you can be your own hotel. You can rent out your space and rent out that. And so what this does, what, what this has done, the sharing economy is taking what has been regulated to corporations and big entities and now, allow, uh, now allowed personal individuals to have a share in that economy. Does that make sense? And I share that as an illustration because this is what has happened. Access to knowing God was only regulated to the prophets of the Old Testament. But what God is now doing in the New Testament, just like Airbnb and Turo and Uber, is taking what belonged to big corporations, now he's given it to the personal individual. You and I have access to God because the Holy Spirit is in us now. And this is what happened on the day of Pentecost in chapter 2. The Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and they began proclaiming truth about God. But remember, this is just not for them. It's a reminder that we too are the sons and daughters, the young and old. We too, because of the Holy Spirit, have access to God to know his word, to proclaim it to one another and the world. 
But before you get nervous to say, is this a message about me becoming a street preacher? All right, do I need to go get a bullhorn? Do I need to start knocking on doors telling people about Jesus? Not necessarily. The whole point of this, the whole point of this is for us to see that the good news, the word of God, the ability to know God is no longer in the hands of the professionals. It's in the hands of regular people. Isn't that cool? It's no longer in the hands of the prophets or the religious leaders. It's in the hands of regular people. And by his help and studying his word, the regular people then and now are now the instruments to tell and live out the wonderful news of Jesus. And we keep, and, and as we keep on reading, we're going to see Peter continue to live out that good news of Jesus and the enabled work of the Spirit, that the work is telling others about the amazing work of Jesus. Let's pick up in verse 22. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for water. Thank you. Verse 22. Peter says to this, to the big group of cro- the big crowd, he says, fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you, you yourselves know. Basically saying, you saw him do all this stuff, okay? You saw him firsthand. And though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you use lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. What I love about that is, is this two sides of one coin. Is God's sovereign hand on one side and our free will and choices. So basically he's saying the crucifixion was predetermined, um, orchestrated and delivered by God's hand, all right? It was God's plan for Jesus to die on the crucified, uh, to be crucified. But on the other side of that, you lawless people led him to do that. And so this, this, this beautiful tension of God's sovereignty and our free will. But God raised him, verse 24, raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Peter pivots here. I'm talking about Joel. Then he begins to preach about Jesus on the cross. He says, this whole thing's about Jesus. Okay, if there's any doubt, this whole thing's about Jesus. And notice the direct tone and the directness and the language of Peter. He's saying, listen to these words. And he gets right at the heart when he says, you use lawless people to nail him to the tree. And later he says, you did this. You crucified him. And then later in verse 29, he said that he was speaking with confidence. All this points to a courage and boldness that we haven't seen in Peter before, all right? And it's obvious there's an immediate uh, enabling from the Holy Spirit in Peter's uh, posture and approach to this crowd. And this is evidence that Jesus was working in and through Peter. And maybe you're still thinking, like, as, even as we sit here now, thinking and looking at Peter's life, you're like, Justin, like, that's great. Peter can do that. But I'm like the person, like, I'm pretty shy. Like, if I order a well-done steak and it comes out rare, like, I'm still the person that's going to eat every single bite and not send it back. Like, I don't have the courage to do that. If that's you, I have some good news for you. Because what you, th- what you think can't be done in and through you can totally be, totally be a possibility with who is in you now. Because of the Holy Spirit in and through you now, you can do unimaginable things. Almost, why? Because almost two months prior to this powerful moment where, where Peter is preaching the good news and Jesus and in the face being really direct and courageous with some people that could possibly kill him, two months or almost two months prior to this, Peter isn't preaching, he's denying Jesus. Three times Peter denied Jesus. And so in this moment, if you think you can't do it, you can. Because God used this man who denied him almost two months prior to this, to proclaim a powerful message that saved 3,000 people. By the grace of God, Jesus wasn't done with Peter. And he's not done with you. If you feel like you can't do it, you don't have the resume or the seminary degree or the articulation or know the Puritan writers, you can be an instrument used by God, not because of what you know, but who you know. Does that make sense? God in you is the instrument and the power for you to do some incredible things. In TLC, there may be some people who here today think that you're disqualified for being used by God. Like, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. 
God can still use you too. Peter denied Jesus three times. If he can use a man to help save 3,000 people, what can he do in and through you? God is looking for available vessels. And this is the whole point of the Bible, all right? God will never ask us to do something that he's not willing to equip us to do. Like that's the whole point, is the empowered spirit life. God empowers his believers to do um, things that we cannot do. He empowers us to do the unimaginable. Why? Because he wants people to say, there's no way that person could have done that. Only, but, only for God. Only for God that that could have happened. And just recently, I asked our staff team to think of three to five ways they can help us grow the church. What can they do personally? And they're thinking about those things and bringing those things in. I want to ask you the same thing, but slightly different. I just want to ask you one thing. What is one thing that you can do this week and the following week to help a person grow closer to God? That could be your kingdom work this week. And maybe it's inviting someone to church. I met some people today that were invited by someone in our church to come to church. That's awesome. Like you'll be surprised how receptive people might be. And if people blow you off, that's okay. Don't take it personal. It's not your ask. It's God's, okay? Maybe could it be sharing your testimony? Like this is what my life was before Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. It was at a camp or somebody shared him with me. And this is how my life is now. It could be 30 seconds. You'll be surprised how that can impact somebody. Or maybe a, a way that you can help someone grow closer to Jesus, to God this week, is just sharing one piece of scripture with them. It could be on a note card or a sticky note, an email or a text. I do this uh, from time to time with people who are far from God or maybe receptive to God to say, hey, this scripture came to mind and I thought it might encourage you. And I just pray that it's a seed planted in somebody's heart. You'll be encouraged how many heart emojis or thumbs up or smiley face emojis you get in return to somebody being encouraged by the text, that scripture. You're planting seeds. What is the one thing that you need to do this week to help somebody grow closer to God? And after you do that, chalk that up as a win. And then go into the next week and the next week looking to do the same thing. And before long, God is working in and through you. And you're doing kingdom work. And you're living out that courage and that boldness that Peter had. That God has equipped us to have. And of course, you're certainly going to get someone that's awkward or doesn't like what you're saying. That's okay. It happens. It's part of it. Who can you impact this week? Peter and the disciples had no clue what God was doing in and through them. And this text was just the start. All they had was that unimaginable moment with an amazing encounter with God, being filled up with the presence of God, Pentecost, okay? The Word of God, you know, the Old Testament. We have the New Testament and Old Testament now. We're equipped with that. And knowing the sense of calling and who they were equipped with, they wouldn't be alone. They were sent out with that. We have that too. All right, just like them. So you'll see, God has changed all of us. We were spiritually dead. Now we're spiritually alive. We have God's spirit in and through us. And we, knowing that, can do the miraculous work of going out, being sent out, and doing the work of God through word and deed. And what I want you to know, there will always be a harvest to the work that we do. There will always be a harvest. When we sow into the kingdom, we're always going to reap a harvest. Remember Pentecost was a celebration of the first harvest of crops. Remember that? They were celebrating the, the harvest. We're going to see as we pick up in verse 37, that the disciples and the early experiences of its first um, experience with God reaped an incredible harvest. Let's pick up in verse 37. When they heard this, that's the crowd, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent. That basically means turn around, have a new way of thinking. Stop living the old way. Do a 180. Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, let's drop, drop down there. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. 3,000 people were saved that day. Is that not amazing? 
And they were changed in an unimaginable way from an unimaginable work and an unimaginable event called Pentecost. And what happened for them is we saw some unimaginable growth from like 12 to 3,000. I did the math on that. That's a 25,000% increase. That's insane. I would love to have that kind of yield in my, you know, 401k, all right? And TLC, the same God who was behind that rapid growth is the same God that is here today. Is the same God who wants to do an unimaginable work in and through us and our church. The same God calling those to do his work then is calling us to do it now. There's no telling what God wants to do in and through our church. He's wanting to be a part. Uh, he's wanting us to be a part of that. And the question is, are we willing to do that? Are we willing and ready to be a part of this unimaginable work today? Wherever you are today, what is God asking you to do to be a part of this unimaginable work of being used by him in Arvada and beyond the world. Maybe it's joining Andy and his uh, kingdom mobilization team of figuring out how can we partner with local entities here to, to establish kingdom work in Arvada and beyond. Maybe it's taking up the challenge of helping one person grow closer to Christ or inviting someone to church with you next week. Whatever it is, what is God asking you to do? May whatever God is asking you to do lead to unimaginable, um, to this unimaginable experience. Just picture this with me. This is what I prayed as I finished my manuscript this week. I pray that God, that we would see a city like Denver that is so far from God become on fire for God. Return back rather than worshiping creation, which our city does. We have some beautiful creation but people worship it. Could we see a movement, an unimaginable movement, where people move away from worshiping creation, but they worship the creator, King Jesus? Could we see that? I pray that we do. And I know that we can see that in our lifetime because of the unimaginable work that has happened in us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your presence to go beyond this place to do unimaginable things. Your presence is with us. It's empowered us. And God, as we continue the study of Acts and look at the blueprint for your church and your kingdom work, God, that is just not a history lesson. It's the blueprint for us now. And so, Father, we want to be willing vessels to do your work in Arvada and beyond. Equip us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.